We are live. I'm still sorting us, but we are live. <laughs> I'm still sorting me. Let me put it that way. Get sorted. I'm working Figure it on out. it. I'm working on it. Figure it oh, out. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm going to say hi to some people. Hello to Alan Gross, Beth Johnson, Linda Sadiq, Lionel KJ7OFH, <laughs> and Zap and Zap Hey, everyone. And G416. Hello. Hello, Scully two cat oh, Sully two cats. I'm sorry I keep turning you into an X File character. You Hello, can Terry. See, you can see where my youth was. Hello, Paul Disney. Kim Barron. All right. Nicholas B. Green W. Hello, hello. Okay. Are you ready? I'm setting my hardware settings and then I have one more window to open. I'm sorry. I I flew back from the uh, Arisia oh, Science. Yeah. yeah, I flew back and we got home super late last night due to the airplane pickup fail. Um, and uh, so everything's just a little bit rough today, but the con was really good. Super, super tiny, which was exactly what I needed. Mm -hmm. um, it had mandatory masking, proof of vaccination, and they were running uh, massive air filters in every single room that kept the air mm. circulating and filtering all the time. That's so, cool. I yeah. Seen, yeah, you don't see that much. So they had like separate ventilation systems that they brought in and installed? Exactly. So there's... Smart. I'm trying to remember the name of them. It's a it's a design that came out early in the pandemic where you basically take one of those giant window fans mm -hmm. and uh, you have it pull the air... Sorry, you have it pull in the air naked and then you push it out through a whole bunch of filters. Mm -hmm. So you take... Uh, a, you build a cube with one side as the fan and all the other sides of the cube are HEPA filters and um, yeah, so that that was doing a good job and they had them in every single room and the bigger rooms had multiples and folks were super good about keeping their masks on and I, I think the staff were also super good about like, put your mask back on because you'd see people who just would like without thinking pull it down to take a drink and forget to put it back up yep. the con everyone's tired and yeah. um yeah it it was it was the first time i've been to an event where it really felt like everyone was trying to take care of everyone else because mm -hmm. they didn't yeah. want to ruin it yep and and that's so different from some of the tweets I saw coming out of Dragon Con of, well, so and so had already spent the money, so even though they tested positive, they went. That didn't happen yeah. at this con. Good and good. It was good. Good good. <sighs> um. So okay. Oh, I guess this is in my way. Okay. What do we got? Uh, <laughs> Backass word. Hello, backass words, weird world, and physics police, and Celia Rigby O'Neill, Ben Kahlo, Paul Gracie, Ruben McCarthy, Shadowcatcher Fox. Hello, all. Um, all right, so we are doing a catch up episode because it was quality, and Pamela's at a con, and mm -hmm. we tried to do this last week, but we malfunctioned at the junction, so yeah. now we're we're back. So, um, let's get started, I guess. All right, I. I am looking for the record button. I have pressed record button one is pressed. Record button two is pressed. We are right. recording. Okay. Astronomy cast episode six, six, six. Solar system references to the underworld. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well. I am so excited about this episode, um, <laughs> mostly because, do you have a naming scheme for your computers? No. There's, there's like no history of like... Nope. No, I just go with the default name that Microsoft wants to give my computers. 
or or so like Fraser's MacBook 003, things like that. That is so, so sad. I do name my Wi-Fi. So my okay. Wi-Fi is called Universe. And then I have another one called Multiverse. Okay. I really and hope the Multiverse is... Is is the multiverse a a a, a, a network that spans multiple uh, no. points? No, no, no. That would have no, no, no. That would have been cool, but no, no. It's it's just I needed three different networks at some point. <laughs> so, so no, no. But you, I'm assuming you named your computers mythological beasts or something. I I do and. Uh, I've had Styx and Cerberus and mm. Moneta, and they they are almost all named after either a Valkyrie or a god or a river or something that has to do with the underworld. And and this all started with my first computer in grad school that was named Strider after the character from Lord of the Rings, where in the BBC audio drama, they refer to Aragorn as Strider almost the entire time. Mm. And uh, I came home from the observatory. I'd been listening to the BBC radio drama while driving for eight hours. And thus came St Strider and the username I have to this day. Right. And you have to explain this every time. Like it's like you're constantly <laughs> having to explain what Star Strider means, which is which I think which I find endlessly hilarious. Like I think if you're going to like I never use a screen name. I'm always just my name. Fraser, Fraser you, Kane, FK. Your last name isn't gay. You should be proud of it. You should be loud so, and proud of having a last name gay. My my SIUE email address assigned by the university was P Gay, and I yeah. couldn't email anyone on either the UK or the New Zealand academic uh, email oh. system because it was considered uh, I I was I was blacklisted because of the word gay being in my username. Right. I. Yeah, it's still a problem. And then there's that whole you can't say gay in Florida thing. And I I want to be able to communicate with well, teachers and name? academics. I think, I think the software doesn't loophole. care. Yeah. Yeah. The software does not care. Well, we did it. We, we made did. it to episode 666. An auspicious number to be sure. What can we do to celebrate this accomplishment? An episode all about the things in the universe that have been named after mythological people and places in the underworld and we'll do this in a second but it's time for a break and we're back all right you've been preparing you're excited i, um, I am so before we really dive into the place that have been named after things in the underworld why do things have mythological names anyway history i i it, this is where we started the the greeks and romans and also uh, the various peoples of the Middle East uh, were among the first to record extensive uh, catalogs of all the constellations of the stars. And we see the cultural links left in the names that we have today. And with Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, these were the first worlds that we watched wander. I wasn't there. You weren't there. That humans watched yeah. wander among the stars. That's where the word planet comes from is wanderer. And so it was seen that these were gods wandering among the stars. And the stars are often associated with, with stories. Uh, Andromeda, for instance, comes from a, a mythological story where a woman whose mother, uh, Cassiopeia, claimed that she was more beautiful than the goddess Athena. Uh, well, that may have just angered Athena a small bit, so she got tied to rocks to be consumed by the monster. And if you're going along the coastline in Tel Aviv, they actually have a place where there is a historic marker marking the rocks where and and this was not something I ever expected to come across, but yet there it is. Hmm, I should have looked for that when I was in Tel Aviv. Um, okay, and so then 
like when we think about some of the places they have like we think about Pluto, Pluto is named after the underworld and and many of its features and so on. So so how do you get to this like which ones get designated underworld hell evil <laughs> places like that? Right. So so this is where it comes down to the International Astronomical Union. Once we got telescopes that were sufficiently powerful that we could start seeing details on these worlds and we started naming things on these worlds and the smaller things orbiting these worlds, uh, different conventions were brought up ranging from uh, we shall name things after the uh, dalliances of Jupiter when we look at the moons. We shall name things after Shakespearean characters with Saturn. And, and each of these sets of rules are often multi-layered. Um, and, and this is our chance to commemorate uh, different cultures. So you will see lots of uh, names now starting to come out of the local lore of the places where the telescopes are built. Mm -hmm. um, this is a chance to commemorate people uh, where we look to the explorers, the poets, the writers. Um, and sometimes it's just a chance to be silly. <laughs> and this is kind of where the underworld has started to crop up with, for instance, uh, a already proposed name for the ninth planet uh, that will replace Pluto as the ninth planet if ever found. Uh, it has a proposed name already of Persephone, which mm. was was kind of the wife of, of Hades. And so here you have this, well, we demoted Pluto, but the the wife is going to get a world and but pluto like is this. a world name too it is and and so this is where uh neptune and uranus were were both named uh originally they were gonna name one of them george after a king and it was like no no no, no. let's go back to the current pattern of roman names roman god names yeah. um Pluto was picked by a little girl in England, and the symbol PL that it uses is for Percival Lowell. So that little girl, I think, got lucky. Um, and, and with Pluto, we now have the International Astronomical Union saying that the moons of Pluto should indeed keep all of their underworld-related names and that the features on these worlds should be named after explorers and things related to the underworld. Um, and, and this is just a fabulous moment of whimsy within our community. We don't get many of those. Right, right. Not a lot of whimsy going on in the astronomical community. Yeah, so, so Pluto's moon, biggest moon, is Sharon, yes. which is the highway, the, the ferry who mm -hmm. carries the dead over the river Styx. Yes. You've got, and then the smaller moons are um, Nyx. Hydra. And Hydra. And Styx and Cerberus, and but spelled with a K. I someday want to hear the story on that one, but yeah. 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 All right, we're going to talk about features on Pluto in a second, but it's time for a break. Hold on, pulling and up a back. map. I'm pulling okay. up a back map. Hold on. I had a telecon that ran late, people, so I don't have everything open on my screen that I would like to have open on my screen. Uh, uh, no, you are not a map. You are a list. You are not useful. You are dead to me. You, you are a map. All right, here we go. Okay, and we're back. So let's talk about some features on Pluto because now, I mean, thanks to New Horizons, we have close up images of Pluto and Sharon, and you see mountain ranges and glaciers and various other features on the surface of, of both of these worlds. And they're going to need names. And let's yeah. dive into, I guess, underworld related names for these places. <sighs> So this is one of those things where there are the weirdest combinations. You have 
over on Pluto, the dark region has been named uh, Cthulhu Rigio, which is uh, Cthulhu is an elder god. Uh, the name is only approximated by the human language and is too terrible for the human ear to truly perceive. Right. Um, right. This is Lovecraftian horror. Yeah. And, and folks, I'm here to tell you, do not try to read Lovecraft. He was a terrible writer who created a fabulous mythos. So read all of the stuff that other people have written uh, with, with, in his... Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And also, like, maybe a terrible person. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, please, uh, please uh, let's continue. So you've got, I mean, you've got this giant, which is great, you know. Yeah, yeah, Cthulhu for target. <laughs> um, so you've got this region that is named after Cthulhu. What else have you got? So you have Balrog, which is coming more from the Tolkien lore. It's cool. Yeah, and and it's all interspersed within. I you really need to have an encyclopedia while you're trying to understand all of these names, because mixed in with this you have Pandemonium Dorsa, and I don't know if Pandemonium counts as Underworld. Um, and then there's 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 things like. Okay, do you count Vikings as being part of the lore or part of the explorers? I'm going to go with it's part of the explorers because it was a spacecraft and they also have Ver Voyager and Venera. Mm. Um, so it's just one of these delightful things where uh, they're mixing all these different ideas together on the surface of a single world. And, and then, of course, next door, you, you have Sharon. And we, we've been looking at this, this blob of light was really all we could say that it was prior to New Horizons getting out there. And now we're seeing that it is this amazingly uh, rich and dark world. And... We have Kubrick here, who was was a film explorer. Film explorer is that a good way to put it? Um, <laughs> film a filmmaker. Yeah, film a explorer. filmmaker, um, yeah. but who made movies that brought out the creepiness of exploring space. So, not everything stays as as creepy as one might want, but it's still pretty cool to look at. And these worlds are still largely unnamed. Um, the New Horizons team is doing its best job, but it's basically science paper comes out with names. Science paper comes out with names, and we're only going to get more and more names as time goes on. Yeah, someone, uh, Zepfen, Zepfen is saying in the chat that there's a Mordor region in on Sharon. Yes, yes, there That's is awesome. Mordor on Sharon. One does not simply go to yeah. Mordor. Right, right. Um, and let's talk about some other worlds. And you mentioned Persephone. Yes. Um, Eris, that's a wonderful so, name, isn't it? So, uh, it is. I thought it was a god of love. Hold on. Personification of strife, the daughter of Nyx. The Greek goddess of strife and discord. And then I think Desdemonia, Desmonia is the Desdemonia. name of the... Desdemonia. Or Daimonia. Daimonia, yeah. sorry, I'm... Yeah, is the name of the moon who was one of the... Okay, uh, Eros is also the, the demon god of, of lawlessness. Love. Okay. Dear editors, we love you. E-R-I-S is Eris and E-R-O-S oh. is Eros, Eros, Eros. So one is love, one is... Is Eris strife. is a dwarf planet, not an asteroid. And I went to the asteroid. That is my problem. All right, the editing right. shall occur right here. All the editing shall occur right here. Yeah. Okay. And let me pull up Desdemonia. Daimonia. Dis Daimonia. Dysnomia. Dysnomia. D-Y-S-N-O-M-I-A. Dysnomia. Okay. And then I think Lithe. Lith. So there's a bunch of them. Okay. 
This is what happens when I have telecons directly before we record. When I do not have telecons, we have much better episodes. Just okay. what else you had you had prepared? Okay, so we'll, we'll go I was instead. looking. I was looking at Eridanus, the constellation. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna talk about this some more, but it's time for another break, and we're back. All right. So you've got some more astronomical objects that have evil-ish names. And and one of my favorites is the River Eridani that goes across the sky. This is one of the original uh, constellations from Ptolemy, and the the River Eridanus is is one that has cropped up in much confusion within the mythological lore. This is a a river that was fallen into uh after well Patheon uh the son of Helios asked to drive his father's chariot across the sky and was granted permission and it did not go entirely <laughs> well as he was uh scared of things like Scorpius the scorpion and so he crashed the car he crashed the car and more than that, I, uh, well, Zeus struck him with lightning after like Draco the dragon and Scorpius all startled and scared this, this young son of Helios. And when Zeus struck him with lightning, he fell from the sky and uh, fell into the king of rivers, Eridani. And, uh, the flames are considered to still burn to this day and lead to a stinking odor. <laughs> now, when you look at Eridani in the sky, it flows one way through the sky, and it was seen to be traveling from north to south. It was then asked, is this representing the Nile? No, the River Nile goes south to north. Okay, mm -hmm. does it represent Italy's River Po? No, the River Po is more of a east-west going river. Um, so, so this is a river that has not been attributed to one on our world, but is the king of rivers and where Helios' mm -hmm. son died after his wild chariot ride where Draco and Scorpius and all the other scary things up there among the stars uh, scared him back down to creating chaos. What else have you got? I, so here where I just want to say we're getting really good at starting to find um, things that are associated with other cultures. And so as we look out at the new icy worlds, we're trying to find myths that are different. And sometimes we are mm. failing in the most spectacular of ways because humans can be stupid. And my um, best worst example of this is the object Arakoth or 2014 MU69. Right. This was which, the other target that New Horizons flew past. Right. And and the problem with, with Arakoth is the name has started to be used um, instead of Arakoth, they're using Ultimate Thule now. There was the other uh, way around. I mean, I think that originally the proposal. You're right. Name sorry. Was which has kind of uh, Nazi. And, yeah, uh, that's the problem. Uh, leanings, and so they suggested they go with Arakoth instead, and so that has that has stuck, and so that's the name of the object. I am giving our editors a 
hot mess to edit edit today. Yeah. So let me go back and restate that so I actually have it correct. Sorry, I'm scan reading. Okay, so so one of the things I'd, I'd like to go and, and talk about is we are starting to try and use more and more different branches of mytho mythology as we try and name worlds that are still being discovered in the outer, outer solar system. And sometimes this leads to a very strange journey. One of the stranger journeys was uh, the object uh, 2014 MU69, which um, was the second icy world uh, after the whole Pluto suite of objects um, that the New Horizons space probe went to. And originally, the name they picked was a little problematic. It was <laughs> Ultimate Thule, which I know we didn't say. Did you say it over in Universe Today other than a, we, na we named it this, but we're calling it this? Well, I mean, it was originally announced. We reported on that. And then yeah. it came to light that Ultimate, Ultimate Thule was the mythical homeland of the Aryan race and had various not connotations and so another name was chosen and and the name that was chosen was uh Arakoth, which uh comes from uh it, it's it's from the indigenous peoples of the united states and so here we're celebrating a new discovery that was made by taking on mythology that almost never sees itself celebrated in modern names in the sky but but so, like is this an i mean w neither's an underworld like i guess ultima Thule has some it's beyond the walls it's beyond the walls of the world so okay. if you aren't part of this world i mean it's it's not exactly where the valkyries carry you away to um but it just seems reasonable to include yeah. it with underworld and but like erikoth means cloud <laughs> in in the pohatan language which i yes. think is which i think is is fun all right uh, we've got one that that i really like that i want to add that i asked if we could add to this and that is the axis of evil <laughs> yes please what please was... explain that one no no i i mean I, i'm asking you to explain what the axis of evil is I mean, the, I guess the Axis of Evil originally came from World War II. They were the, the Nazis, the Japanese, and the Italians were part, were the Axis powers. And then I think in, had, didn't like George Bush say that the Iranians yeah. and the North Koreans and, and China and no, no, and, um, uh, no, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea, I think was the new Axis of Evil. But there was, object a cosmological object that was found in the cosmic microwave background radiation that had a weird temperature temperature that was outside of what you would expect with random variations in the cosmic microwave background and That's so it was called the axis of evil <laughs> So, so there's also in co cosmology the axis of evil, which is the weird correlation that appears uh, between the plane of our solar system, aspects of the cosmic microwave background, and it it seems to make it look like we are in a special place, which we absolutely are not. And, and so this weird coincidence has become known as the axis of evil. And I mean, I think it's probably what dust, but it's like a correlation between as yeah. you say, the, the solar system and the cosmic microwave background. Like they, they line up in some way, mm -hmm. but it's probably dust. It's yeah. We're still trying to figure it out. It, the, yes, it is probably dust, but, uh, it's just one of those things that we look at, look at, and it's like, huh. And for whatever reason, we've decided that correlations that don't seem to have a causation uh, are evil.
<laughs> and you know people have proposed ideas like maybe it's like some sort of tear in the fabric of the cosmos where another universe no. is leaking in or the temperature from our universe is is leaking away from from the universe into this other universe but yeah like it's it's, it's come on it's always dust <laughs> so sometimes it's a magnetic field you have to give magnetic fields their credit we're doing. driving dust but yeah yeah all right well i think we've reached the end of the episode thank you pamela Thank you, Fraser. And thank you to everyone out there who makes this show possible. Uh, this week, I would like to thank some of our patrons this week, uh, Kellyanne and David Parker, Jeremy Kerwin, Stuart Mills, Rob Cuff, uh, Harold uh, Barterhagen, Jem Kimberly Reich, uh, Matthew Horstman, David Gates, Scott Cohn, Daniel Loosley, Jim Schooler, Scott Bieber, Justin Proctor, Alex Cohen, Marco Irasi, Philip Walker, Matthias Hayden, Disastrina, uh, Kenzaya Pinfienko, Tim Garish, Claudia Mastriani, Jeff Wilson, Gregory Singleton, Benjamin Mueller, Cooper, uh, Tim McMacken, Paul D. Disney, Don Mundus, Ninja Nick, Kenneth Ryan, uh, Janelle, Omar Del Riviero, and Iran Zegrev. Thank you all so much. You are what make this show possible. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. And I have to apologize to everyone this entire content for this show fell out of my ma my mind while doing a telecon mistakes were made and i did not write down notes by hand as i was planning to mm. yeah i i need to do that no you don't you just need to have a, a like a document oh i see you just like had a bunch of documents in front of yeah. you yeah right. yeah and that was the problem yeah yeah like I know um, somewhere on this web page it has the information, no idea where. Yeah, like when I'm doing my space bites, I will like we pick the stories that we're gonna talk about for the week for my news roundup, and then I will just I will just put in just brief bullet point notes for each mm -hmm. of the stories because I, it just helps me and then That's I don't even look do. at my notes. It's yeah. the process of writing yeah. the notes formulates in my thinking and then it's really easy to just follow and do the do the actual presentation. Yeah, and instead what I did was desperately scan read things. Yeah, uh, yeah. And Yeah, I can't I can't <sighs> read I can't read and explain things on the fly. I have to do just a modicum, but I also don't have to like write scripts anymore, which is right. lovely. Like yes. I love not having to write scripts. I just I just like all of the stuff I do now is just all off the top of my head. That's that's amazing. Um... <sighs> okay. Let's see what all is going on over on Twitch. Yeah, hey, go um, ahead if you have any questions. Otherwise, you're going to get a rant. Hello, Chai Latte Nebula. Hello, Broken Symmetry. Hello, Ruben. Uh, hello, Smurf Berry Barbecue. That's a bit disturbing. Uh, hello, Adam Altogether. Hello, Renee Geo. Um, hello, Not the Brain. Hello, Imm Immortality 13. Hello, X the King Guard. Um, hello, Veronica. Hello, all of you. You are welcome. <laughs> Broken Symmetry in a great moment of punning said I needed to dust off my memory. <laughs> um, okay, no one has a question for us. What shall we rant about this week? Um, so I want to talk about the comet. So if oh, you ZTF? Yeah, so if you aren't aware, uh, Comet uh, C3 2022 ZTF, which was discovered by the Zwicky Transit Facility, is going to be showing up on, well, it's it's visible right now, but it's going to, it's sort of hard to see. It's, but it's really shifting. close. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's shifting into the, a really nice place to park a comet in that it's going to be apologies for the folks in the Southern hemisphere, but it's going to be moving above the big dipper mm -hmm. in past Perseus and into Cassiopeia over the next two weeks or so. And so pretty much every night start, I'd say it's starting about a week or so, like maybe in the mid, like the 22nd or so. And I think it peaks on February the 3rd, but you never know when you're going to get clear sky. Exactly. And it is not a great comet. No. Like it it's is very not, green. It's green. It's very, very green. Sure. 
Uh, but I mean, lots of comments are green, but it is well positioned and easy to find. If you know how to find the Big Dipper, you can find this comment. Take a pair of binoculars, go out. Like I said, don't don't yet, like maybe in about a week. I mean, we've got a detailed description about the comment on, on Universe Today, and there's lots of explainers that'll show you yeah. the path and the maximum magnitude. And like I said, it's going to be the brightest and closest to Earth on the 3rd of February, and it will be right in Perseus, Cassiopeia. So they're easy constellations to find. Like if you can find the Big Dipper, you can find Cassiopeia, draw a line between them. The comet will be somewhere in that region. And this is just your chance to do a visual observing of a comet that's easy to find. Take your binoculars out, your small telescope, scan the region, you'll find it. And and they look nice. You know, they're they're perfect binocular objects. And this is just the universe again spitting in your yeah. eye and saying, I know how to produce a bright comet. I just choose not to. <sighs> we had Hyakataki and Hale bought back to back and mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because like I was, I was mentioning like we haven't had a good comet since Hakutake and Hillbop, and a couple of people kept saying we had comet Neowise, and like no, I spit on that. Comet the same. Neowise was mediocre. Like yeah, you yeah. could see it with the unaided eye. If you knew where to look, you saw a faint little blurry spot in the sky with your eyes. Yeah. Whoop de doo. Yeah. If you you could see it in your binoculars, your small telescope. Yep, definitely a comet. But Hakutake and Hillbop, like you went outside. And it was blazing, and mm -hmm. it had this gigantic tail that stretched for a huge portion of the sky. Like 30 you, degrees. It yeah, you could amazing. be in the middle of a city, and you could and see this comet. See it. It's there's We've had nothing like this. Comet Haley was garbage compared there, to... Okay, there are Hale. children that have been born, mm -hmm. lived, went to yeah. college, and graduated yeah, since my, Hale Bop and Hyakutake. Yeah, yeah, my kids have never seen a bright comet and they were born after like just after until yeah you know they're in their early 20s now and this yeah. is this is ridiculous yeah so no no don't tell me that neo wise was acceptable neo wise was garbage and we deserve better yes. we deserve a bright comet that blazes across the sky that for that foretells the doom of mankind it's fine i'll take it but I want to see a, another bright comet, and Ison was going to be our chance. That was going to be the comet of the century, and then it, and then it just didn't have the staying power. It got torn up as it went around the sun and was gone. So no, no, don't tell me that Neo Wise was a good comet. It was garbage, and this one's going to be garbage too. That's how I feel. There, here ends the rant. <laughs> be careful what you wish for. This is backass words. Weird world. I, I want the Earth to pass through the tail of a comet. I want a comet to pass through the upper atmosphere. That would be cool. No. It happens about once every 100,000 years or so, and a comet will come so close to the Earth that it actually buzzes the, the atmosphere. That would be really bad for satellites in low Earth orbit. It'd be fine. Space is big. Lots of room. It's just a brock, you know, a couple of kilometers across. It'd be fine. The number of micrometeorites that would come from that, though. Fine, that would be great. They would just cause more meteor shower. It'd be amazing, right? You'd have this comet blazing through the atmosphere. You'd have meteor showers going on at the same time. It would be stunning. It would be one of the most incredible things we've ever seen. Um, let's see. So we some questions here. Um, Galaxia asks, how come it's green? Does that mean that it contains metal? No, oh, it's a story it's, here. It's actually a uh, dicarbon. It's, it's C two, and uh, when the C two atoms uh, get excited, they give off green light. It's just that. So one of the things that's really cool is, yeah, as you said, dicarbon C two. Back at the the turn of the 20th century there was a comet coming close and it was going to be pretty green and astronomers detected the presence of cyanide they just developed the, yes. the techniques of spectroscopy and were able to detect the presence of cyanide in the in the halo of this comet and they were worried that that earth was going to get poisoned by this comet as it went by 
and people yeah. freaked out and panicked. And I think we're wearing like gas masks as oh, the comet went by. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I mean, you could imagine sort of like at the time. Yeah. It was yeah we just didn't uh, understand. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see, when was it? Uh, 1910. Yeah. Yeah. So they detected cyanide gas in the tail, which I think That's is amazing. just. amazing. Yeah. Which is just great. Um, it was it was Haley's comet, yeah. Um, Bankalo asks, "How many AU out do the farthest comets go?" Thousands and thousands and thousands, and the ones that are farthest just leave the solar system. Um, comets, the, the comet blah, 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 ZTF, which stands for Zwicky Transient Facility, which is the place that found this particular comet. Um, when they ran the orbits, it looks like it was last going past the Earth when there were Neanderthals hanging yeah, out. Yeah, 50,000 years ago. But the orbit has been altered enough that this should be its last pass into the inner solar system. Mm. And this time it's just going to go away on an escape trajectory. So the Oort cloud, which is the source of many of the long period mm -hmm. comets, is tens of thousands mm. of astronomical units wide and so like it thought that the Oort cloud stretches halfway to alpha centauri you could be fifty thousand astronomical units so like like a light year away is where these comets are they are following the sun they're still in the sun's gravitational field but they are really far away and so these comets will be you know pushed out of their their cloud and fall down into the inner solar system for the first time the journey takes thousands of years and then they fly in and then fly back out to the outer solar system again um uh zapfan zapfan is asking any recent updates on planet nine no sadly i i really think that it's going to take the vera Rubin observatory to either find it or disprove mm -hmm. it and last i checked they were looking at first light sometime this year yeah um and i don't remember what they currently think will be the amount of time that it takes to prove or disprove that it's there i want to say it's like two years um mm -hmm. yeah so that's where we're at yeah so so Con oh, sorry um uh the wise mission the wide infrared survey explorer from nasa mm -hmm. it was designed to look for faint objects in infrared it was a dwarf planet hunter and a and a um brown dwarf hunter yeah and so it had the capability they did a very detailed survey of the outer solar system and they were able to rule out any jupiter-sized objects out to about 20,000 astronomical units and they were able to rule out any Saturn, any Saturn objects out to about a thousand AU and any Uranus and Neptune objects out to about 2000 AU. So if planet nine exists, it has to be a Uranus or Neptune sized object yeah. that is beyond 2000 astronomical units or a Jupiter sized object that is beyond about 20,000 astronomical units, or like an Earth sized object that is a thousand AU away. And so it's kind of nice, like, thanks to yeah. Wise, they've been able to rule out bigger objects closer. And now it's just a matter of searching to find something that could be there. And th like, there's yeah. gonna be a bunch of stuff out there. Thanks to Vera, Vera Rubin is going to turn up. Like, again, it's going to feel like just this fire hose has been turned on and it's it's going to be so many asteroids and so many quasars and so many variable stars and so many objects in the Kuiper belt. It's just going to it's going to feel overwhelming like James Webb. But I feel like more so like James Webb, you're pointing it at one target and then you're pointing it at another target. Yeah. Uh, but one week of observation from Vera Rubin and you're going to have discovered Death. T tens of thousands of things yeah hard drive so death hard drive death hard drive. <laughs> yeah it's, they've got big hard they know what they're doing they got big hard drives yeah yeah it it's also one of these things where with jwst you're sometimes just going to sit on one field for a long time studying one thing and the researchers are going to take the data that they 
uh, asked for to study one thing. And for all we know, Planet Nine is in that image and it doesn't get noticed because the researchers were looking for something completely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Arjun asks, how much bigger are comets than meteors? Okay, so this is where things get very weird with naming. <laughs> so the rock when it is in space is a meteoroid. The rock when it's coming through the atmosphere is a meteor. The rock when it hits the surface of our planet, the fragments that are left are meteorites. Meteor and so what is a comet? A comet is a giant thing of ice that hopefully does not come through our atmosphere because that seems like a short path to death. So it can never be a meteoroid. Correct. But can it be a meteor? So, so meteors in general have so far been small objects and we refer to the thing that killed off the dinosaurs and created the KT boundary as an asteroid impact. So... Well what about Chelyabinsk? Chelyabinsk was a, it was a smaller object that blew up in the atmosphere. No, I understand, we, but was it a meteor? Yeah, it was a meteor, but we okay, don't know if okay. it was majority ice or majority rock. Right, but it was like house-sized. Yeah, yeah. Right, and so, so if it was made of comet, like there's a lot of house-sized comets out there. Fair, You're right. fair. Mm -hmm. The, the the point is that the naming convention, like when they're out in space, they're and in fact, like the, the yeah. defining time between comets and asteroids is getting pretty mushy yeah, at this point. It really is. But but I do agree like like I like when we talk about this kind of thing, I get a bunch of rules lawyers popping up in the chat, kind of going, Well, actually Right. And, and I think it all depends on who you talk to. Yeah, I something... think I want to have just like an exception argument with this person. Well, what about? What about? What about what about a what about an asteroid that has like tendencies and is 100 meters across and it hits the atmosphere? What is that? Yeah, yeah. So I, we've both like spontaneously started reading Alistair Reynolds' books at the same time, mm -hmm. just different ones. Um, I'm reading the the series that starts with Blue Remembered Earth, and it mm -hmm. uses the phrase "asteroid" in it, and <laughs> and yeah. I. I want I want this word to become a thing that we use regularly. The book was written in 2012, so Kuiper Belt objects had already been named Kuiper Belt objects at that point. And so we have Kuiper Belt objects, we have uh, Oort cloud objects, we have trans-Neptunian objects. I want the the universal word for things that are orbiting on non-cometary orbits to be Isteroid, and they become mm. a comet when they become active. This, mm. this is, I don't know if anyone would ever listen to me, but I like no, the term no. isteroid. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm on. Okay, so let's, let's just define it right here, mm -hmm. and then I'll just push it with my platform, and then it'll just take hold. So, so if it's in space, yes, it's an isteroid. Yes. So that can be uh, that can it can be living in the Oort cloud. It could be living in the Kuiper belt. It could be living in the asteroid. Belt, it could be a centaur. It could be in the Earth's Lagrange point. It's an asteroid. Okay. When it gets like too that. close to the sun and develops a tail, it becomes a comet. Yes. Okay. When it enters the atmosphere at any size, it becomes a meteor. And the parts that hit the ground are a meteor are meteorites. Yes. Although they should be like in an ice. But the ice barrier. doesn't make it to the su surface That's of true. the planet. That's true. That's all right. Only the rocky yeah, meteor. parts do. And meteoroids are thrown out. They have no place in this new naming convention. I agree with that. Okay. Because like, well, like what is the difference between a meteoroid and a comet and an asteroid. It's ridiculous. Yeah, meteoroids are just what we call the tiny ones. Mm -hmm. um, why did, Why does size get a special name? I don't know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's decided. Okay. Um, okay. We solved that. Uh, 
There's someone's gonna say. There you go. All right, Sirius Kaylee says, okay, we presented at the next I IAS meeting. Like, what's the difference between dust and a meteoroid? And that's the thing. There, there really isn't. So you have gravel and dust-sized bits of stuff that we uh, hit during meteor showers that appear as meteors. So that blob of dust you might see in a sunbeam could, if in space being hit by our, by our atmosphere, become a meteor. So it's hard to call something like that a meteoroid because it fits on yeah. the head of a pin. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like when it, when a, when you see a meteor, it's the size of a piece of sand, as you say, it sits on, yeah. fits on the head of a pin or smaller. Yeah. So that dust. And sometimes it's the... gravel. Sometimes it's gravel. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, like I forget the definition of dust, but dust is up to like, less than a like one milligrams i forget the the specific definition yeah. of, of dust but this is like i have two annoyances okay i have, only probably two? have more only two two that i can think of right now people always, right. people ask me this like i people someone asked me this question on one of my question shows like what is a scientific misunderstanding that drives you crazy and the and the one that i hate that drives me bonkers is when I'll say like there's a supernova, like Betelgeuse is about to go supernova, and and someone will go, well, In actually, the fullness of time. Well, actually, Betelgeuse is 500 light years away from the Earth, and so in fact, when we see the oh, light from I Betelgeuse, we're seeing 500 years ago. Like, yeah, obviously, we understand yeah. that light takes time to move through space, but riddle me this, um, relativistic. Uh, Inter interlocutor um uh what is the what does the speed of the observer what impact does the speed of the observer have on when the light from Betelgeuse is expected to reach us because if you're down in a gravity well did it happen 500 years ago if you're moving at close to the speed of light did it happen five years ago 500 years ago no it didn't so the only way that you can make observations about the universe is when you see them. And that in is- In our rest frame. In our rest frame. Yeah, pick so, a rest frame. Yeah, exactly. And so I think, and the way you pick the rest frame is you just say it happened when we observe it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I'm down And you could say that. light travel for a X amount of time, but it's, but I, it's like I'm talking about really complicated concepts in cosmology and then someone will be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't you know that things in space happen in the past? The, this and, is consistent with the yeah. rule that if you need the answer to something, you don't ask a question on the internet. You write a wrong answer, and then people will correct you. If you just right. ask the question, no one's going to answer you. But people yeah. love to say, but actually. But actually, yeah. yeah. <sighs> you know, in fact, like, like, and now I feel like I'm just going to start trolling people about the dust <laughs> on the Mars rovers. Right, because I've explained it so many <laughs> times about about why the Mars rovers, like why they didn't try to clean up the dust. Like, no, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, what's the craziest part is that NASA was able to work out all of the technology to be able to send a really complicated robot to the surface of Mars to be able to handle temperatures that would destroy existing electronics and battery systems solar panels designed to work at one quarter the amount of electricity that they would receive here on earth to navigate very complex environments often autonomously and yet with decades of understanding experience about the kind of dust and watching it accumulate on every single spacecraft that they've ever sent there they they have no way to remove dust they don't know how to do this you know that's that's yeah. the trolling that I'm about to now do. Like, I wish there was a way. Like, how do you remove dust? I don't know. Nobody knows how to remove dust. <laughs> like, dust gets on stuff, and then you're like, I got to throw that thing away. That's how that works. <sighs> because, like, obviously. This is the rant, people. This NASA is the true rant. Of, yeah. Obviously, NASA has thought about this. Obviously. But I think, you know, I'll just get more um interaction on my youtube channel if i just 
troll. It's true. It's true. You will. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Physics police wrap the solar cells in 10 layers of plastic. See, you can't resist. Can't yeah. Nobody can resist this. Nobody can resist. Let's send the helicopter over. Let's put a little brush. Let's tip them. Let's electrostatically charge the solar panels. Let's um, blow them with a little bit of wind. Right? Let's all of these things. Like each one of these, there are probably 100 papers that have been yes. written by NASA yes. exploring these ideas. It's true. And, and, and none of them have have been able to make the cost benefit to be effective. Um, but that said, there is a, a new material that NASA has developed that is is clear and allows you to run an electrostatic charge through it to repel the dust. And it's this this material can be painted over solar panels, over camera systems over various electronics and then and then with a fairly low charge they should be able to repel the dust and stop it from from building up and um yeah you might you, you know, i mean physics police you say or maybe i'm the first person to have that idea like i've seen that idea many times before but it's possible that nobody at nasa has considered a a cling but the, a cling wrap like okay so you've got to have this stuff it's got to be able to handle re-entry onto mars it's got to be able to be able to cover up the solar panels and not ruin the efficiency of the solar panels. You've got to be able to have some mechanism for extracting just one layer at a time from the solar panels and so on and so on. Right. And so they just like the folks behind the NASA mission, the rovers just said, we got $200 million to build a spacecraft to sit on the surface of Mars and dig. And that's yeah. what we're doing. Right. Every single Oh, there you go. Steve Squires, the um, proposed the idea as well. Yeah, so it's like every day idea. And so I guess my point is, it's not like there aren't clever ideas and it's not like someone couldn't come up with a clever idea. Like, yeah, absolutely. It's just that. Within the budget, within the weight restriction, yeah, within yeah, the electricity are, restrictions, yeah. it. My rant is just that people can't resist. People can't yeah. resist hearing about dust on Mars and rolling their eyes and saying why don't they just that's it that's the part that that's the part that i find um funny is like and and why don't they just my my snarky i guess maybe is the right word response is often it was only supposed to last 90 days the dust wasn't a problem at the end of 90 days mm -hmm. And, and so do you design to meet your spec or do you design in hopes of? NASA is not going to fund you to design in hopes of anything. Yeah. Um, Devin Gibbs saying just a rumble. See, there you go. Just put a rumble pack on the rover and have it shake off the dust. Um, the problem is you can't shake off the dust. The dust is electrostatically clinging to the rover. And so shaking it won't work. Yeah. They tried that. <laughs> um, the The most effective idea they've had so far is they used a shovel and they picked that was up brilliant regolith yeah. and poured it on the sand on the panels, and it was able to Carry extract dust away. some of the dust away and increase the the panel efficiency, which was pretty clever. Yeah, and that was nobody with had inside. ever tried that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love I inside. Inside yeah. is dead. I am sad. All right. So, so that's it. Those are, those are my, those are my, you know, um, reference frame, dust on panels and what do we call things that hit the earth? Those are my three bugbears. And, and I want uh, the word isteroid to be used outside of Alistair Reynolds. Let's see, book series. That's it. I'm, I, I'm going to now enforce it with okay. brutal, uh, you know, efficiency to my writing. No, I'm not. <laughs> but I'll, 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 I mean, the, the one that I'm trying to push, like Dave Dickinson, you know, after mm -hmm. there was the super moon, he's trying yeah. to go with mini moon. And I feel like we've been able to make some progress with that one. The opposite of super moon is a mini moon. Um, I like yeah. that. Yeah. So but we also have them as like a honeymoon. So like a little honeymoon. 
And then the other one is uh, Milk Dromeda. Yes. The merger between Andromeda and Milk. Because people have gone like Milkomedia. No. No. Uh, Andromeda Way. No. Milk Dromeda is the correct portmanteau. Yes. All right. Uh, we've reached the end of our hour and then some. So it's true. That was, uh, it's that true. Was a rant. Uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us today on this very special day of Astronomy Cast. What's coming up in the Pamela Sphere? So we're going to be working on recording our first episode of Event. event sorry, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. Of Escape Velocity, not Event. Escape Velocity Space event News. Velocity. That's what I started to say, and that made no sense. Yep. We're going to be starting to record our first episode of Escape Velocity Space News this evening on the Cosmo Quest uh, Crowdcast channel. That is a Patreon benefit, $10 and up. Um, so come check it out if you are one of our patrons. And if you aren't, consider joining our community. This is how we fund everyone to, well, put science in your head. Wonderful. Um... I have nothing interesting, except I am interviewing like 10 NIAC award recipients. I can't wait. Yeah, me too. I'm pretty excited. So so we've got some really cool ideas. You know, airplanes on Titan, beams that shoot little little pellets at a spacecraft to accelerate them, fusion drives, um, fleets of satellites that will form a uh, like an inter big interferometer that will let us see yeah wavelengths of, of radiation that have never been observed before. So there's actually parts of the radio spectrum that humanity has never seen. Yeah. Which is exciting. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us. Um, and we will see all of you next week. Bye-bye, everyone. And then they searched for the button to press.